Think of Lonergan, you know, who was a great student of Aquinas. Be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable, and then be responsible. The four steps in any uh, responsible engagement of the world. Led us in mass this morning, and it was you know extraordinary out there on the piazza. His sermon, you know, he really stays on message, emphasizing how the the synod is not a parliament; it's not a, a democratic debating society. And the the language he always uses is the protagonist, the chief actor of the synod, is not any of us; it's not him; it's the Holy Spirit. And the idea is to listen in each other's voices, but for the voice of of the Holy Spirit. Synod on Synodality. You, this isn't your first synod. How many have you been at? Not my first rodeo. I did the um, Synod on Young People, which was five years ago, 2018. Uh, so it's my second synod. How does this compare? Peter and Paul came to this town a long time ago. And they weren't here, you know, just to listen to Roman culture. I mean, fine. They were here with a message. Evangelion is good news. And it's good news that will change the world. And in fact, it, it worked. The fact that over there, where Peter lies buried to this day, but dominating this once imperial capital is the cross of Jesus. You know, that didn't come welling up from Roman culture. That came from a message that these people brought. We should do our work with the same energy and the same and ash in the same conflict. I stand in the great Vatican II tradition as interpreted by the great post-conciliar popes from Paul VI to Francis. Um, the Catechism of 92, I mean, that's where I stand, and I come out of that perspective. When, when you're appealing to some objective truth, you're finding something that will link you to another person. So it's not like just my private set of convictions are against yours, so I'm gonna attack you because you don't like me. Can we prescind from that and say, no, you know, together, through argumentation, we're seeking the truth. And if we find it, it'll link us together. Together, we're looking to a transcendent third. In this case, the truth, the good, the beautiful. And, and in that measure, we get closer to each other. It's not just Christ next to the culture, not just Christ absorbed by the culture, it's Christ who positions the culture. As Vatican II says, you know, we read the signs of the times in light of the gospel. It's in light of Christ that we interpret the world. And the church, look, I look out at the city of Rome here, you know, and we've been around for a long time and we've been through a lot worse than we're going through right now. So we will endure. So Christ gives me hope and the Holy Spirit gives me hope. The fact that we've been given this great message, we've been entrusted with it, 
but we're under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Name one ancient culture that would believe in, you know, all you need is love, as John Lennon also said with the Beatles, and the brotherhood of man. Those are Christian ideas, inescapably so. So you can't say on the one hand, imagine no religion, you know, no hell below us, above us only sky. No, no, no God. But boy, oh boy, do we want the brotherhood of man. You can't do that. That doesn't work. The brotherhood of man follows from the fatherhood of God. And that's a that's an old Christian idea. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. How did the so-called new atheism rise so quickly in the early 2000s? What made people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens so popular and effective? And how did this new atheist movement decline and end almost as quickly over the past few years? Those are the topics we'll be discussing today with Bishop Robert Barron, who joins us from Rochester, Minnesota. Bishop, good to be with you. Hey, Brandon. Good morning to you. You recently rolled back in from Harvard, of all places, one of the yeah. premier Ivy League institutions. What were you doing there, and how did it go? They invited me to do uh, the opening of the year Mass, the Mass of the Holy Spirit, for you know the Catholic community of Harvard. And there's a gorgeous church there called St. Paul's, which I'd heard about but never actually had seen. Um, beautifully decorated church, and they have this uh, kids' choir of kids, actually, very sophisticated young people who sing at a very high level. Um, so it was a beautiful place to see and to hear. So I preached there. I preached the Mass for the uh, Holy Spirit. And then that afternoon, I went to, it's called Memorial Church. It's the main sort of classically Protestant church at the heart of uh, Harvard Yard. And about a 1,000 people, they say, gathered there, jammed that church. And I gave a talk on the uh, Catholic intellectual tradition. So it was just a joy. I, I loved that day. It was, a, it was a busy day and a very full day. Um, you know, saw the um, the dorm where both FDR and JFK were students, saw the room where Mark Zuckerberg was when he was at Harvard, uh, the chapel still standing where the young John Adams would have uh, worshipped. So it's a beautiful place to go. I've been to Harvard a couple times, but it was my most thorough um, kind of immersion in it. I'm just delighted to hear that there was such a big Catholic response to a religious figure coming in. You usually hear, especially at these Ivy League institutions, they've been secularized. There's no place for religion. So the fact that they welcomed you with such yeah. a big crowd is is really encouraging. It was, yeah, it was to me. Well, today I, I want to start by really recommending and then discussing this brand new book. It's by a friend of ours named Justin Brierley. He is the longtime host of the unbelievable radio show in the UK, which you've been on before, I think a couple mm -hmm. times. Uh, but he yeah. wrote this excellent new book called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. Um, I know you've read a big chunk of it, as have I, and, and I'm hoping we can do a series of discussions on the podcast using this as the leaping off point. But today, I just want to focus on the opening chapter, which details the rise and fall of the new atheism movement. This movement has long been an adversary of War on Fire, of your work, your videos and writings over the years. So let's just start with defining it. What is the new atheism? What made it new? And how is it different than your classical Enlightenment atheism? I always see the new atheism, which emerged in the early uh, zeros, right, uh, as a post-9-11 phenomenon. So 9-11 happens, uh, 2001, and it, it revived this old Enlightenment trope that religion, in the measure that it's irrational, is violent. So because you can't adjudicate your, your dispute through debate and argument, the only way you can do it is through violence. And think of Enlightenment figures, you know, from Voltaire to Thomas Jefferson, 
who would say that about religion. It's the source of much of our, you know, the violence in the world. So that was revived for obvious reasons after 9-11. So here's these religious people who are crashing airplanes into buildings and killing thousands of people. That's the problem with religion. And then that event uh, was articulated by some, I would call them remarkably gifted rhetoricians. And here, you know, Christopher Hitchens comes to mind, obviously. One of the most rhetorically gifted people of the last, you know, 25 years. Uh, Richard Dawkins, I, I won't comment on him as a scientist. I'm not qualified to, but certainly as a kind of popular rhetorician, someone that knew how to appeal to emotion and stir up people's, you know, feelings. Sam Harris, another good example, a bright man, but basically a rhetorician. Um, uh, Daniel Dennett, so the, the four horsemen of the new atheism were people who, I think, fueled by their native anti-religiosity and then encouraged deeply by September 11th and then um, using their extraordinary rhetorical gifts stirred up in a lot of people a visceral emotional reaction against religion. Now, they they used arguments to be sure, but to be fair and honest, they're, they're pretty bad arguments or rehearsals of old um, atheist tropes from a long time ago. Uh, what was new about them, it seems to me, was their nastiness and and the uh, the sort of naked appeal to emotion and stirring up people's visceral anti-religiosity. Um, that was what was new about it, seems to me. Not the arguments as such, which are actually rather old and, and tired. Um, I'll say this, you know, our ministry— I think my my word on fire ministry really begins at that same time, uh, right around the year 2000. Um, I started doing internet work, you know, 2006, 2007, right at the time when the new atheists were very much in vogue. And so I confronted right away armies of young people that had been evangelized by the new atheists. And, you know, I, I see it now maybe as a, it's an expression of the divine providence that that our work commenced right when there was this enormous animosity toward religion. Um, but to answer your question, I think that's what was new about them was post-September 11th, the, the kind of nasty, provocative, rhetorical style of these uh, authors and the fact that they did influence large swaths of, uh, of young people. I know a lot of commentators look at the rise of the new atheism and, and ask themselves, why did it arise when and where it did? And you've hinted at one of the major causes, the 9-11 attacks. In his book, Justin Brierley looks at two other contributing causes. One was the rising culture war dialogue around religion and science, particularly debates about yeah. evolution curriculum in America. And then thirdly, the rise of the internet and social media. Yeah. Talk about those latter two, the faith and science, internet, social media. How did these fuel the new atheism? Well, the social media thing, and we've talked a lot about this, has a positive side and a negative side. Negatively, you know, how views can sweep through entire populations, you know, very quickly. And because of the nature of social media, they tend to be rather superficial. So people making comments and a quick reaction and largely emotional response. And I came across that, Brandon, early on when I, I do a video talking about God. And then I'd be met with these, these you know, we call them trolls now, I suppose, but met with this you know, visceral, deeply emotional kind of reaction. And I was, frankly, surprised by that, naively, I see now. But you know, I, I was expecting Bertrand Russell-level engagement, you know, like serious counter-arguments. But I met with this wave of largely emotionally driven uh, superficiality. That was a product of social media, I think, for sure. And that contributed to the new atheist wave. The science thing, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been talking about that for years. Um, we, when I say we, religious people, we, we dropped the ball on that, I think. We allowed that conversation to be taken over by evangelists for a scientism and a materialism. And that was a, a huge problem. As I've said a million times, we religious people have nothing, nothing, nothing against the sciences. What we do stand against is the philosophical perspective of scientism or materialism 
that says reality is simply coextensive with what can be seen and measured, you know, empirically. Well, that's a that's a highly controversial philosophical position to take, and one that that is very hard actually to justify. But but we did allow the conversation, I think, to get hijacked and co-opted by those who were coming from that perspective. And what they did is they made religion seem then silly and and um, uh, primitive and pre-scientific and mythological. Um, and that was, of course, used by all the new atheists. Um, you know, Dawkins was a scientist. Dennett's a scientist. Sam Harris is a um, like a neurologist, right? He's a brain. Uh, Hitchens was was a, is a journalist, but the other three were scientists, and they they used that I'd call it deeply mistaken view. Um, you know that that materialism is is simply self evident because of of what the sciences have discovered. So you uploaded your first YouTube video in 2007, which, as you noted mm-hmm. earlier, was right in the sweet spot of when this new atheism was arising. Yeah. In fact, from 2006 to 2008, the bookend years, all four of these new atheist horsemen released best-selling books denouncing God. So Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, uh, Sam Harris, Letter to a Christian Nation, and Daniel Dennett, Breaking the Spell, Religion as Natural Phenomenon. Each of these books sold hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of copies, massively popular, especially among young people. I I remember I was in college at this time, seeing so many college kids in the library, on campus with these books. Why do you think young people responded so eagerly to these new atheist materials? Because of the I'll be judgmental here, but the superficiality and the very highly rhetorical style of these books. So that will appeal to someone who doesn't have a real critical edge, uh, hasn't considered these questions deeply. You read, you know, like Dawkins or, or Hitchens, for example, both, I mean, bright men to be sure, but their characterization of religion was just absolutely a straw man. I mean, it, it, it betrayed zero sense of a sophisticated approach to the Bible or to theological questions. But they were so rhetorically gifted that a lot of young people were swept up in it. Secondly, you know, and this is as old as Adam and Eve, what I mean is um, there's always a kind of resentment against religion because religion speaks of God and God's demand. Well, at some deep level, all of us sinners, we don't want that. We don't want God making demands on us. We don't want God telling us how we should live. We don't want a, a very objective moral norm hovering in front of us. You know, I'd rather live my life on my own terms. So someone comes along and in a at least rhetorically persuasive way says, you know, there is no God. Religion's all, all nonsense. There is no God. Well, there's a kind of permanently adolescent side of me that will always say, hey, great great. Now I can live the way I want to live. I think there was a lot of that, too, in the in the popularity of these figures. So the New Atheists had a heyday for about a decade. It wasn't until the, yeah. the early to mid-2010s that you begin to see the New Atheism dwindle, and then ultimately, I think it's safe to say, fall apart. Um, Justin Brierley traces a lot of this out in his book. There were scandals and infighting among the many atheist and secular groups, complaints about the leaders being all old white men. Uh, But Brierley also points to this interesting tension that eventually broke. He said, on the one hand, these new atheists like to present themselves with tremendous bravado and and arrogance. In fact, uh, some of them called themselves the brights, you know, in contrast to the doles, the religious people. They were supremely confident but on the other right. side, they seem to also be supremely cowardly. I know that during these years, it was one of your own gripes about the new atheists that they refused to debate some of the leading religious lights, people like William Lane Craig, and instead would pick on the least sophisticated, the easiest religious people and arguments. Is that the case? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I'll give Hitchens credit. He did debate Craig, and I think Sam Harris did too. There's a famous debate at Notre Dame. And, you know, the, watch the Hitchens-Craig uh, conversations. Because what I've noticed in them, I think Hitchens, almost despite himself, was impressed by William Lane Craig and knew that he was dealing with a, a formidable opponent. And he realized, okay, my rhetorical games aren't going to work with this guy. 
And so they, they all relied on, on you know, their, their usual tropes, but it, they didn't work with someone as serious as, as Craig. And so I think those are kind of instructive. Um, and I wonder, too, and this is, you know, part of Briarly's argument, that as formerly agnostic and atheist people begin to take a deeper, closer look at religion, was it because the new atheists, in their bravado, as you say, summoned us again to pick up our game, you know. Now, this goes back to one of my themes that makes some Catholics mad, but it's simply the case that we dumbed ourselves down for so long. We dropped all those tools, all those weapons, which I don't hesitate to call them, the weapons that we can use to fight off those who are trying to attack us. And in the measure that we, we left all that to the side, we were defenseless. When these superficial attacks were coming at us, we weren't able to defend ourselves. Um, I think as the new atheists did engage serious religious people, you know, th- th- something began to shift in them. And, and they realized, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe we are being too uh, uh, abrupt here. Or maybe we aren't being sufficiently reflective. Uh, and that's, I think, an interesting part of Briarly's story. Briarly seems to agree with you. In fact, he provocatively says at one point, I thank God for Richard Dawkins. Our harshest yeah, critics right. are often the ones who help us to grow the most. He says, new atheism has revitalized the intellectual tradition yeah. of the Christian church in the West. Would you agree with that? Yeah, right. Certainly at the apologetic level. And and I press it too, Brandon, because I would say to um, theologians operating at a very high level, university theologians, that they lost their connection to the living church and the connection to apologetics. Go back to Thomas Aquinas, who was a theologian at the very highest level of speculative systematic theology. At the same time, and because of the first, he's also a great apologist. I think we drove a wedge between apologetics and high speculative theology where our, our best university people didn't engage these these attacks on the church at all, it seems to me. Uh, Craig is the great uh, counterexample. Um, so I think that's a that's a good development from it, that we need to reintegrate our high university speculative theology and on-the-ground apologetics. Um, you know, I want Jean-Luc Marion and David Tracy and those people in the front lines of apologetics. Um, and not just entertaining the highest, most abstract uh, questions. So I think in all those ways, it has awakened us, yeah. If I can mention just one more um, reason that Briarly gives for the collapse of the new atheism, he notes that it's essentially parasitic, that it has nothing positive to offer, that at the end of the day, it failed to satisfy the longings of its adherents. Let me read you a, a couple paragraphs that he wrote. He said, many people had turned to the new atheism for its promise of a brighter, more rational, and more scientific future. They believed it held the key to human flourishing. Just as the secular anthem, Imagine, had envisioned a world Mm -hmm. without religion, heaven, or hell, it was only reasonable to suppose that the song's utopian brotherhood of man would naturally follow. Yet, despite John Lennon claiming it was easy if you try, it turned out to be quite complicated. What could a movement that was built on tearing down God erect in his place? Science was the obvious alternative. Surely that was an objective truth to which all people could aspire. But science turned out to be a poor substitute for a savior. Science can tell you how the universe arose, but not why it is there. It cannot purchase a meaningful existence. I think he's getting on a really key insight that the new atheism was really effective at causing people to doubt God's existence and the goodness of religion, but very bad at providing any satisfying alternative. Would you agree? No, quite right. Go back to Tom Holland here. You know, his great work has been showing that the great ethical values of the West, that we say, oh, they're grounded in the Enlightenment, in fact, are inescapably Christian values. Now, link that to John Lennon. So, you know, the brotherhood of man. Did Julius Caesar believe in the brotherhood of man? Tom Holland, who knows the Roman world as well as anybody, say, absolutely not. You know, would the ancient Greeks have believed in the brotherhood of man? Absolutely not. Name one ancient culture 
that would believe in, you know, all you need is love, as John Lennon also said it with the Beatles, and the brotherhood of man. Those are Christian ideas, inescapably so. So you can't say on the one hand, imagine no religion, you know, no hell below us, above us only sky. No, no, no God. But boy, oh boy, do we want the brotherhood of man. You can't do that. That doesn't work. The brotherhood of man follows from the fatherhood of God. And that's a that's an old Christian idea. Uh, Holland, I think, is as is, is good as anyone today at showing that relationship. And so the, the new atheists wanted the brotherhood of man business, but they they kicked, they they sawed off the the branch they were sitting on, right? Um and then science, right, is a very poor substitute. The physical sciences are great. We love them, and they make our, our lives much more convenient because of technology, and they give us insight into, you know, the planets. and All that is great, but they won't tell you one little thing about the meaning of your life, the purpose of your life, what makes life beautiful, what makes life morally upright, what's the ultimate purpose of my existence. The sciences won't give you that. Finally, you're a new atheist and say, there's no God. And young people, all right, you know, stick it to religion. And, oh, yeah, we want to get rid of all that. And what am I left with? I came from nothing. I'm going to nothing. There's no objective value that determines the meaning of my life. And I'm stuck in an existential desert. That's where the new atheism, like the old atheism, has left me. And so once I get over the kind of my my adolescent you know uh, sense of triumph, that's what I'm left with. Now welcome into the picture the Jordan Petersons and the Tom Hollands and and the Douglas Murrays and people who maybe would have identified as agnostic or even atheist, and are starting to say, "Now wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something in this religious thing that's not just." stupid superstition and oppression and, you know, religion poisons everything, that maybe there actually is something to what the great religions have been saying. And that's the moment I think Briarly identifies correctly as where we are right now. We're at kind of a turning point moment. Yeah, I, I think that's, to me, the most fascinating part of Briarly's book is he's pinpointed this reality that the new atheism has has become tired and spent. And the church shouldn't spend its time wasting away by arguing with the Dawkins and the Hitchens of the world and, and their acolytes today. But we've got this new vanguard of, of interesting skeptics and non-believers. You've mentioned several names already, Jordan Peterson, Douglas Murray, Tom Holland, David Rubin, or uh, Dave Rubin, many of whom you've whom you've conversations with, yeah, Briarly yeah. has as well. And what Briarly notes is that these guys are asking different questions. They're interested in different things, posing different challenges than the new atheists of before. In your own interaction with these figures, have you noticed that shift as well, that there's a yeah. new interest, a new type of question being asked? You know, go back to uh, Dave Rubin, because I've been on with him a number of times, I think three or four times. The very first time was out in L.A., and I was on his show. And at that point, he was an atheist and said so and, and told me he climbed to the, to the top of Mount Sinai because he from his Jewish background, he was interested in doing that. And he said, you know what happened when I got to the top? Nothing. Nothing. I felt nothing. And so he announced himself as, as an atheist to me, you know, unapologetically. Well, I think it was the second or third time I was on with him. I casually said it. I didn't mean it in any way uh, to be critical. I just said, we well, you know, now, Dave, for you as an atheist to say that, that's rather interesting. And he paused and he said, I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm an atheist anymore. You know? And that's when I realized, okay, something has shifted around. Now, what was happening was he was traveling at that time with Jordan Peterson, who was talking a lot about, I mean, I would say about God. He's talking about the Bible, about the you know, spiritual dimension of life. And I think it had a big impact on, um, on Dave Rubin. And then Peterson himself, of course, is a, is a prime example of this. Uh, a guy with a very scientific background, but who started to read and think his way toward what the great religions have been talking about. Well, I'd like to encourage everybody, again, to pick up Justin Briarly's new book, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, because what I'd like to do is for future conversations, walk through some of the additional chapters in the book where he notes the, the questions that skeptical seekers are asking in regards to science, culture, history, and the Bible. So maybe we can have a separate conversation about 
each one of those topics. Well, it's time now for our listener question. If you have a question that you'd like to ask Bishop Barron on this show, you can send it in to us at the website askbishopbarron.com. A woman named Mary from Minnesota has done just that. She submitted a question for the bishop about the Holy Spirit. Here's Mary's question. Hi, Bishop Barron. This is Mary from Minnesota. Thank you for your good work. I am calling to ask, does the Catholic Church teach that the Holy Spirit has a gender? Thank you, and God bless. Yeah, thanks for that question. The the answer, obviously, is no. God is a spirit. God's not material, and gender is associated with our bodies, and so God doesn't have a gender. God is not male or female. Uh, Now, that begs the question, how come we use, you know, pronouns? We use the the he, him pronoun when talking about God. The classical answer is that God, who's octus pure, sorry, pure act, God who's the creator, God's the one who generates and gives rise to the world, God is is that reality which can never be receptive, right? A creature can't affect God as though God is is moved by a creature. So classically speaking, we associate the the male with the generative side of a sexual act, the female with a receptive side. And I think that's why in the Bible and the Greek tradition, uh, we associate the, the masculine pronoun with God. Now, to say that is by no means to imply that we can't use metaphors for God that are more feminine. So the Bible indeed talks about God in a more maternal way and as a hen and so on and nursing with delight at her breasts and this sort of thing. Fine, fine. I think we can say God is like a woman. God is like a mother, um, you know, because God is beyond anything creaturely. So we reach for all sorts of metaphors to describe God. And so it's it, to use the, the masculine pronouns about God is, is by no means to be anti-woman or to say that, you know, men are we're deifying the, the male gender and all that stuff. That's not the case at all. Um, but I, I would say, strictly speaking, no person of the Trinity has a gender because God is beyond the physical. 